WNST, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore Positive. The Crab Cake Tour is rolling on. The hashtag is Crab Cake Tour. Uh, I even managed to uh, pilfer a little bit of Smith Island cake off of Tylerton into a cooler owned by Jack Brooks of J.M. Clayton, mule through Cambridge and back across the eastern shore through Kent Island and had a proper Narrows crab cake and delivered said Smith Island cake to Catonsville to the uh, former Baltimore County executive, Don Moeller. You know, that cake, that's going to slow you down watching all this golf this Ooh. week, Moeller. We wolfed that cake down, but this is a big, big week uh, in Baltimore. Baltimore golf, lots happening. And Nestor, we have a special guest to kick it off. Well, yeah, I, I'm missing the golf tournament this weekend because I'm going to be uh, like uh, like Tony Bennett, high on a hill. Uh, I'm going out to Western Maryland, doing some fly fishing, eating some crab cakes. But they're having a little tournament here this weekend. And here to talk all things, not just uh, the BMW and what's going on, but also weather and golf and and uh, all the majors. Dave Hutzel, a PGA Golf Pro at Pine Ridge Golf Course. I think last time I left him was uh, high on a hill at Woodhome with uh, Bruce Chris and raising a lot of money for There Goes My Hero through great foundations and leukemia. Dave, good to have you uh, back around. A pleasure. Pleasure, and I appreciate you sitting in on behalf of everyone uh, at the Classic Five here this week. It's a big Baltimore golf week here this week. I think anybody who knows anything about golf, this I talk a lot about the World Cup and getting the World Cup here in 2026 and what that would mean. This is a pretty good score for our area and our region, and I, I hope weather holds up and course holds up and everything happens good. I think it's going to be a great week. Uh, this is as close as we can get to a major championship, and to have it right here in Baltimore after all these years, close to 60 years since we hosted a PGA Tour event. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have some others, some senior tour events and some college championships, but to uh, get you know pretty close to the top 70 players in the world, uh, it's going to be a great opportunity for our community to see these guys play and, and play at a high level. Well, Dave, it is exciting, and I, I will date myself with your course. I was I was trying to think today how old I was, and I don't think I was much more than 10 or 11, ah, maybe 12 or 13, and I remember traipsing around Pine Ridge with my uncle at an LPGA event, getting to watch Carol Mann and Mickey Wright. Uh, I can still see them coming up 18, and that was, I mean, as far from where I sit, you guys are the crown jewel of the uh, classic five. And uh, yeah, there was excitement. I love with your golf day. here. Cause Moeller starts geezing about golf stories. I mean, I've heard all of your BS about education <laughs> and, you know, and government and po- I I love mean, the know, little white golf ball. stories, man. I, I get these out of you sometimes. Well, man. We're going to get into Pine Ridge plenty, but I want to, I want to jump in with Dave about the, the BMW coming on the heels of the Northern trust. And Dave, as we record this, Typically, the Northern Trust would be in the books. We'd know who the top 70 are. And I don't know if it's ever going to stop raining in Jersey, Jersey City so that they'll be able to finish. What do you make of all this? Well, it's certainly going to throw a little kink in their plans. Uh, anybody who has had the opportunity to uh, get to Kays Valley in the past, which I'm sure some of the guys have. I mean, there's a close relationship with Jordan Spieth and Under Armour, so I know he's He's been around a little bit over the years and uh, he may have a little advantage over some of the others, but uh, you know, there with the number of uh, corporate type events and special guests that they, they've had at Caves Valley over the years. I'm sure there's a few guys that have gotten a sneak peek, but uh, few you know, presidents guys, have made that maybe, trip. I think that I think it have been a few presidents walk those links. They sure have. Uh, hey, can I uh, ask both of you this? Cause you know, I, I'm, I'm a snob from Dundalk, right? That, and I've learned about the beauty of the state and, and Dave, I don't know if you know, I'm, I've been traveling around doing 30 crab cakes in 30 days. I've been all over the Eastern shore past golf courses, driving down to Crisfield Sunday. saw a golf course. Mm-hmm. Um, Caves Valley is a place I've been two or three times in my life. People have invited me. My wife was sick. There was a member there that, you know, she was balled out on the golf course, eating a fruit ball, you know, like people have been mm-hmm. kind to us. I've been there for an event or two. I'm not a golfer. I've been invited to play there more times than I could count. You know, Hey, you want to play? We're playing caves. I don't play and I don't get it. And I, I just don't get it. Right. So I, and it pisses Don off. Like it pisses off people that I don't get lacrosse. There are things I get and there are things I don't get. You don't get field of dreams for crying out loud. Hang so on there's a, a long <laughs> list. Caves Valley. I would think there are lots of people like 
Dundalk, the Dundalk I mean, there's a lot of people that have never been on the club level of a, of Raven Stadium and just to see what it looks like or experience it or been past the, the red velvet rope, right, of whatever Caves represents financially, socioeconomically, all the things we talk about around here. A lot of people have never been to Caves and they're never going to walk on Caves ever. This is a week you can pay and maybe do that. It's talk to me, both of you, about the beauty of Caves. I'm assuming both of you have played it, if not walked on it, right? Yes, I, I've been fortunate enough to play there a few times over the years, and uh, it is a special place. It's a beautiful piece of property in Baltimore County, uh, rolling hills, uh, beautiful trees, uh, and a great Tom Fazio layout. And uh, I think everyone that <laughs> goes there appreciates that um, and, and the special service that they receive upon entering the gates. It's a great yeah, place. I, I could not agree more with Well, I'm trying to it's, figure out what makes a golf, one golf course better than another, other well, than like making one college better than another. Every golf course I've ever been on, at, like literally in my life, and I've been on a hundred, you know, like they're all beautiful. I mean, they're, they're all selected to be beautiful. They all have natural beauty built in. If it wasn't beautiful, they would grow the trees to make it more beautiful. That that But Caves is this different level, and it took me a while to even – Never knew it existed for a long time. But once I found that out, I'm like, oh, this is the Augusta of Maryland, right? And I think the same thing would be yeah. said down in Potomac or w- wherever that tournament was played at Congressional. That's another place. That's a special sure. place, right? Mm-hmm. Very, very yeah. special. And as Dave said, when you walk on the grounds, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really delighted that Dave referenced that when you walk on the grounds, it's just special. I mean, it, it, the clubhouse is special. They have residences there that make it special. And Dave, what, what I think, what I think so exciting for people to get to go out there this weekend. And I've got a, uh, I've got a 10 year old grandson who is getting treated by his dad to go out there. and He's over the moon because he loves golf. And what I think people aren't going to see on TV, and maybe you talk a little bit about this because you've played it. The few times that I've played it, even though you have a caddy when you go out there, which is fun for the average guy like me, it's unbelievable up and down and slopes. Flat. There aren't a lot of flat lies at caves, right, Dave? And that, that sort of separates it from a lot of courses. Uh, I would agree with that. And, uh, you know, the average golfer, um, you know, maybe that doesn't play a lot of golf, they go to the driving range and they hit off the mats or, and they got a level lie all the time and a good lie and <clears throat> may not seem that challenging. And even though it is, but uh, as they get onto a golf course that, that has a lot of uh, contouring and you got the ball above your feet, below your feet, you know, side hill lies, all those things, you know, that's what makes golf so much more challenging than a lot of other sports. And that gets me that gets me back to my question, Dave, from a few minutes ago. It would seem seem talk to us about you've been at this a long time. Heck, you were out there. You and we're gonna have you talk about your experience, what it feels to be out there on the tour. But it seems to me, my, my brother in law was out there and worked for the tour for a long time. Seems to me that golfers, like many athletes, are creatures of habit. And they like to know they're going to show up on Monday and play a few practice rounds and show up on Tuesday and hit chips from all different angles. And play. and now the 100 and what is it, 20 players, whatever, trying to get to are still at the Northern Trust up there in uh, Jersey City. What does that do, Dave, to the psyche of a golfer who's trying to get ready to tee it up on Thursday? The whole schedule's out the window. It is. And excuse me, a lot, uh, most guys are, are going to be required also playing a pro-am on Wednesday. So, you know, their practice round, they're going to be playing with, you know, amateurs and, and uh, taking care of them, so to speak, um, while also trying to do their their homework and their caddies will be doing their homework. They're going to walk the golf course. They'll get out early uh, before even the players will get there at times. Uh, they've got their yardage book, but that only tells them so much. And they've got their green books these days, so it helps them read the greens a little bit better. Uh, but, you know, those guys that are up there, you know, they're, they're not teeing off till 1130 today, the first group. So they're, it's going to be, you know, six, seven o'clock before that tournament's probably wrapped up today. And there are a few guys, I'm sure, that are at caves today that missed the cut. You know, Colin Morikawa, you know, he's near the top of the FedEx Cup list. 
And he's, he's probably down there today getting a little practice in where those guys won't have that option. And then you also have some guys that are on the bubble. I know Phil Mickelson's right around that 70 number and he missed the cut. So he, he may be down here. He may be practicing and may not even get in, you know, it's, it's kind of an interesting, interesting dynamic there. Well, it's, 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 it's a great, when golf came up with the FedEx cup, I wasn't sure how it was going to work. I was maybe a bit skeptical, but I think it's been a real winner for golf. It keeps the interest beyond the majors. Um, you mentioned pro-ams. I've, I've been fortunate enough to play in a couple of pro-ams and had very, very gracious partners. My sense always is, from talking to some folks close to the game, pro-ams aren't really high on the list of things that professional golfers like. To, am I right on that? It's like they do it. They know it helps the game. They know it's ambassadorship. But trudging around with guys like me who are 12 and 15 handicapped, that, that isn't the highlight of their week, right? Uh, yeah, to a degree. I would agree with that. It's um, I've, I've played in a few of them myself. Um, you know, I played in the Kemper Open in the early 2000s a couple times. I was, you know, last minute, you know, one of the guys couldn't play. They said, hey, can you play? I said, sure. And, and uh, you know, it, it's – it's a long day. Let's put it that way. I think that's part of the issue. Uh, not always the company, but just part of the issue that, uh, you know, you're maybe spending a little more time out there than you would like to. And, and obviously it's the, the day before the event and everybody wants to get their rest and their, and their proper amount of practice in. But uh, as a golf professional, they understand. And, and we understand as golf pros at clubs, that's part of your job. You know, you need to entertain those folks because those folks that are playing in the pro-ams, are big sponsors. They're taking care of you. Right. They're putting money in your pocket. And there's a reason why they're playing for as much money as they are now. And $60 million in a purse for the FedEx cup. That's, that's some pretty, uh, pretty outstanding money there for them. The yeah, no, the no, this is, this is a big thing. And I know, you know, I know that you're high on, on Marikawa and, uh, you know, you got Jordan and John Rahm, and who knows? With John Rahm's year, who knows? You know, he he he's liable to come in and break his leg and still win. I mean, this is this is going to be a movie about John Rahm's year, right? Oh, I year. mean, it, what are, I mean, it's the stuff books. I mean, he really ought to sit down and write a book. But talk to us a little bit about Marikow, and and this is what's so crazy about golf, right? You look at that kid and you say. Man, that kid's going to be in contention every tournament. And all of a sudden, he misses a cut. What is it about golf? And and I always say, I always say, Dave, you know, if I go out and am fortunate enough to shoot a good round, and let's say I have a, a really good day for me, and I shoot seventy nine or eighty, I say, man, it's a good round for me. And I go out a week later and shoot ninety five. I'm saying, how can the guy who shot seventy nine last week shoot ninety five today? And then I look. Well, how can a guy that shoots 63, like Marikawa, come back and shoot 76? I mean, what is it about this sport that makes it so hard to repeat success? Well, I mean, I've always felt, and you've probably heard before, golf is a fickle game. You know, we, uh, we go out there and we have a, a plan of attack for each hole, each shot. Sometimes you execute, sometimes you don't. And how you deal with those uh, misfortunes is, is a huge part of that. I mean, it's, it's, um, it, it's a fine line. Um, you know, one day the putter gets hot, the next day it's not. And it's a difference between shooting 65 and 71. And nowadays on the tour, you know, you go out and shoot 71 a couple of days, you can go home for the weekend. Oh, hey, D Dave, you were at the, I'm going to get you to talk about your experience, but, and you may have had a similar experience to my brother-in-law. The, the, my brother-in-law was out there for two years and didn't make a cut. And, and he's a flat-out great player. Didn't make a cut. And to my memory, people have heard me tell this story before. The year that Tom Watson was the player of the year, his stroke average for the year, and compared to my brother-in-law's, was like two and a half strokes per round. My brother-in-law didn't make a cut. And Watson is player of the year. I mean, like you say, it really comes down, doesn't it, to whether or not you have the hot blade that week? It really does. And, you know, the, the really neat thing nowadays, there's so many statistics available. Um, you know, if you go to the PGA Tour website, you can look at all the shot link data. And, you know, 
players, you know, in that area, when your brother was out there playing, you know, they didn't necessarily have that. Um, so they had to kind of do it on their own. They had to figure out what they needed to work on. And, you know, guys can look online right now and say, oh, you know what? My strokes gain putting has really dropped off. I need to work on that. Or I'm not driving in the fairway enough. I need to work on that. And, you know, distance has become a big thing these days. I mean, guys are hitting it so far. I mean, the, the percentage of guys out there flying the ball 300 yards is is it's crazy um so that's a huge advantage so if you if you drive it in the you know 300 plus you may be in the rough you got a much better chance hitting a eight nine wedge out of the rough than a guy does back there in the fairway hitting a six iron into the green so you know those those numbers are there uh and available so that they can go to their coaches and say hey you know here's what i need to work on Dave Hutzel is our guest. He's PGA golf professional at Pine Ridge Golf Course, one of the classic five. Uh, get everybody ready for the big tournament here this weekend. You can find him uh, out uh, on the uh, the Instagram thing at D Hutzel PGA. Or is that Twitter? That's Twitter, I think, uh, as well. Twitter, yeah. uh, Twitter. I'm sorry about that. Uh, and Don Moeller, of course, joining us here, uh, golf aficionado. Um, you know, Don, for this week, you're you're going this weekend? People are going out this weekend? Oh, people, you know. It's going to be packed. As I said, my family's going to be there. Uh, I'm going to try to make it. I certainly love the game and and would do everything I can to get out there. Uh, I, I, you know, I want to give a shout out. And Dave probably has heard this as well. I've heard from some tour folks. They are over the moon about the support that they've gotten from Baltimore County government and from the private sector uh, in the Baltimore region. The private sector and the way they've worked hard to sell the tickets and create a first class event. And I've heard some tour folks say that the, re- the support they've received from County Executive Oshevsky and, and his administration, it's just really unparalleled. So that, and that really, really makes, makes a difference. Uh, so it's an exciting week. They, Dave, take us back though, jump back in the way back machine when you were out there and you wanted to be the, next master's champion tell tell kids like my grandson the 10 year old who likes to thinks he's bryson d chambeau and goes out and swings like happy gilmore tell him what it's like out there when you're trying to to make a cut and you show up well um you know experience is is um uh, is so important um uh, you know i was working as a club pro when i qualified for my first kemper open I was working in dc at columbia country club and uh, we, we threw our mid Atlantic PGA had a section qualifier every year and, you know, we get 50 or 60 guys, all PGA members that would play 18 holes. It used to be a Montgomery country club one day shootout and the top two guys got in the event. And, uh, first year, I think I shot 67 or eight and got in. And luckily, you know, one of my friends was also in the event and, uh, you know, he had played in it before. So. You know, I leaned on him to kind of help guide me through the ins and outs. I mean, just getting on property, you know, getting registered, all those kind of things. It's it's um, it's it's eye opening. You know, you got to make sure you got your parking pass. You know, you don't want to get turned away at the door. You forget something. You're not getting in the game. So um, once you get there, you know, getting comfortable on the range. I'll never forget my brother, my older brother, caddy for me the first time. And we're standing on the range before the first round, loosening up. And I looked to my left, there's Tom Lehman. I looked to my right, and there's Greg Norman. I'm like, how cool is this? You know, that was sort of your, that was sort of your tin cup moment. Was Norman wearing a hat or anything? What was it like? (laughs) Oh yeah, he had the big straw hat on. You didn't (laughs) shank it, did you? You didn't, you didn't hit Norman like tin cup, did you? I did not. I did not. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Well, talk about that pressure, Dave. I I like that because by that time, you did you play golf in high school? Uh, I did not. I actually played baseball. I was a baseball okay. player and played played in college for a few years before kind of transitioning more into golf. So, so when did yeah, you pick I mean, the game up for real? Uh, probably, you know, I started when I was in college. I played two years of baseball at UMBC and then a year at Towson. and I transferred because I changed majors. And, uh, you know, after my junior year, I was having some some elbow issues. And decided you played for I, Billy Hunter? I started, no, Billy was the AD when I was there. Okay. Played for Mike, Mike Gottlieb. Okay. But I met Billy when I transferred. Yeah, okay. yeah, great guy. Yeah. So, you know, after my junior year, I hung it up and uh, ended up, they started a golf program again at Towson. This was in 93. And I just walked on and uh, I was working at, you know, the golf course at Mount Pleasant on the maintenance crew during the summer. And I'd work 530 to 2. And then I'd go out and play in the afternoon at 2 o'clock, 
and just worked on my game. Had some guys that I, I played with there that were good players to help me. And then eventually, you know, I got my handicap down to, you know, low single digits and said, what the heck, I'll try and walk on, you know, my last year at school and got on the team. And, you know, we weren't great, but it was a great experience and got the program rolling again. And uh, after graduating with a PE degree, I decided to get in the golf business. And then, you know, seven years later, I'm playing in my first PGA Tour event. Well, that, so Dave, was, Dave uh, that's pretty, un- you would say, right? <laughs> uh, to all our kids listening out there, that's pretty unusual to not really take it up until you're 20 or 21 and then get good enough. I mean, that you obviously had some incredible uh, innate ability to be able, because, you know, my experience has been, if you're going to be really good at this game, you, it looks to me like a lot of these young kids that just, you know, they swing naturally. I mean, old guys, I've got a bunch of friends who didn't pick it up until they're in their fifties, let's say. And boy, mm-hmm. it's hard by that time. It seems to me for those of you who are golf pros to create that beautiful swing, kids come out and they don't know any better. And they've got this beautiful takeaway, right? Right out of that's jump right. street. Uh-huh, I mean, it really, really and, is you know, remarkable. Thank you. The, um, the, the process though, I mean, it was a lot of hard work, obviously. Uh, I worked, um, worked on my game quite a bit, got some great instruction and, you know, over time, uh, just got more tournament tough. And, you know, that, that there's, like I said before, there, there's no, no, um, nothing more important, I think, than experience and being able to get in there, get your feet wet, you know, take, take your bruises and your lumps along the way and, and learn from it. And who knows what can happen once you put that time and effort in. That, that's, that's pretty exciting. Hey, Dave, a couple of Pine Ridge questions. Cause I, I, full, full disclosure, I, Love that course. It, you know, there are a couple of others that stand out to me, but T- Pine Ridge would be on a short list for me. If somebody said, if I want to play a a, a tournament in the state, uh, I mean, a, a, a golf course in the state, where do I go? I, for me, that beauty playing around that Lock Raven Reservoir, I mean, that that's right there with, you know, any other course in the state. And I want to talk a couple of things that always jump out at me. I have heard, and tell me if it's urban legend, that number eight at Pine Ridge is consistently ranked one of the top par threes, not only in the state, but in the region for its beauty going over the reservoir down to a green. It looks like it's a postage stamp, even though it's bigger than it is. Tell people a little bit about number eight and what makes it so special. Well, I mean, it's, first of all, just a beautiful golf call. And we got, you know, the reservoir to your left. As you drive up to the green, you can actually look across the reservoir and see the bridge, Delaney Valley Road. Uh, but, you know. You can see the WNST Tower if you look off in the distance. <laughs> <laughs> you can. You know, from the back tees, you can stretch it out to 200 yards. And uh, like you said, the green looks awfully small from up there. And it's an elevated tee also. So the ball's in the air a little longer if you got a little wind blowing around. Um, you know, there's nowhere to miss left. Let's put it that way. You got bunker short and you got the reservoir left. You yeah. miss it left of the green. Yeah. There's such a slope. Yeah, there. I've hit a there. lot of shots up on that little hill on the right, uh, Dave, <laughs> because good. there's That's no good... place to hit it left. I mean, it's That's like, right. it's a hard one to hit. The, the other question that I have and tell, tell me if, if this is true, folks have told me over the years, and I, I've never looked into this, that there are challenges at keeping Pine Ridge in the quality shape that it typically is because of the environmental regulations associated with being so close to the reservoir. Is that accurate or is that not accurate? Uh, I I couldn't tell you exactly, but I'm sure that uh, our superintendent works very closely with the uh, Department of uh, Natural Resources and uh, what he can and can't do in terms of maintenance of the golf course, because, you know, we have so much beautiful wildlife out there between the deer, the geese, we've got wild turkeys. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a, it's a beautiful area and we certainly don't want to disturb the environment there, but, uh, yeah, the, the golf course, you know, for the number of rounds we get per year, we, uh, it does a nice job and, and the golf course looks beautiful and, you know, we are, we we're very fortunate to be as busy as we are. Uh, I think we're probably one of the busiest in the area. And, uh, you know, the, the tea sheets stay full and COVID certainly been a big help to that. And uh, with everyone, quote unquote, working from home and uh, sneaking out and playing an extra round here and there, it's uh, it's been, been a nice boom for golf. 
And wild well, turkeys you- running out. Man. <laughs> oh, it's, you know, it's- I, I, I had that on Hart Road. You know, I, I looked out one day, and I, they must have flown over. But we, we had some down at Christmas. I haven't seen a wild turkey in a while. So, you know, if you well, got those, we're coming. Ridge. It's, 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 a, it's amazing. Nestor, just to go out there and walk around, as you know from Hart Road, it, it's amazing. Hey, hey, Dave, real quick on the – the challenge that you said, because it is so popular and over the years, people have said, I love Pine Ridge, but man, the pace of play, it's a challenge out there. What, what do you do to try to keep the pace of play moving? Well, we, we have typically two marshals on at all times, uh, both front nine and back nine. Uh, we've spaced our tee times out to where we can, uh, you know, not have those backups. And we also, uh, this year brought in, uh, a new company with, you know, we have GPS on our golf carts. Not that the player can see, you know, the whole design, but we can see where every golf cart is on the golf course. And uh, we can, we can be a little wow. bit faster alerted to where we might have some pace of play issues. And I can see it on my phone. I can see it on the computer. We can call a marshal and say, Hey, this group's falling behind on hole number six. Can you go over there and have a little talk with them? Encourage them to pick up the pace a little bit. And, uh, you know, we've been, we've been working at about a four and a half hour pace yesterday. We were at four and a half hours and, uh, you know, in the middle of the afternoon on a rainy day, um, you know, we, we are also able to kind of keep an eye on where people are driving the carts. We get the occasional person that likes to take it a little too close to the green or might be car path only, and they're not obeying by the rules. So we can, we can t- better target those people and, and go out there and, uh, give them whatever assistance they need to kind of stay in line and, and keep things moving but we yeah that's been kind of a, a, a i know in the past we certainly had that reputation but we're working hard to uh, get people around the golf course in a reasonable amount of time time's important Dave, okay, we appreciate you taking some time here during a busy week. And I think for golf folks, everyone, um, it's a little bit like a, a beacon of light, right? This tournament here, the last six months, calling all the golf people uh, together this weekend. So I hope for good weather. I'll be thinking of you guys when I'm drinking wine and, you know, out in the mountains with my wife and uh, having crab cakes and all of that stuff. But hope we get to uh, meet again. It was great having you on as a guest Dave. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Dave. joining us here, and uh, you can find him, and uh, we talked a lot about Pine Ridge, but all the classic five, you can find him at D Hutzel PGA out on the Twitter thing. You can, afford, of course, find Don Moeller as well uh, out at D Moeller 5. You can find both of us along the Crab Cake Tour and Smith Island Cake and a little bit of baseball talk, and I'm sure – an epic, epic recon here as we get ready for football season as well. On behalf of former Baltimore County Executive Don Moeller, I am Nestor Aparicio. You can reach me, Ness, at BaltimorePositive.com. You can also find us out on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all the usual places. And the Crab Cake Tour hashtag is Crab Cake Tour. I'm Nestor. We are WNST, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore. And we never stop talking Baltimore positive. <laughs>